to, tries to recognize the word kind of holistically, and it does a really terrible job. So we, the, so <clears throat> children who are dyslexic have this great difficulty learning to read because they're not they're not recognizing letters and making the connection between the sounds. But what's great is that because the brain has plasticity, we can teach those we can teach those children um, in a very careful way and bring about then and we can actually create those circuits. The only problem is is that they're that they are not always really fast. And there is a problem. So the things that can go wrong in reading that disrupt the reading process is uh, kind of re I represented here in the pyramid of reading behaviors. And this you'll find in uh, Marianne Wolf's work and in her book, Proust and the Squid, um, that talks about fluency and reading in general and how, and how print the history of written language, basically. Um, so, at the very foundational part uh, here are our genes. There's a genetic foundation. And there is a genetic component to dyslexia, too. So, uh, so <clears throat> the, uh, the genetic foundation is there, but genes express themselves differently depending on environment in many cases. So, um, so with the genetic foundation, depending upon the kinds of experiences and behaviors the, that a developing child has, they will develop certain neurons and circuits which will lead to actual structures in the brain for reader and then eventually based on those uh, perceptual motor and conceptual processes will actually develop which will lead to reading print. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, this is interesting except that anywhere along the line here things can go a little bit wrong and so which can slow down reading. Okay, that was, I promise that's, that's the end of the, of the, of the neuroscience lesson. Um, anybody have any questions at all? Anything? Are you all bored, silly? Yes, um, <laughs> yes. When you talked about the pathways, the oral pathways being recycled, uh -huh. are you talking about the I guess it's two questions. And you referenced evolving, so you're talking about a, a child's oral pathways that they have been using being recycled, or are you talking way back in the evolutionary process? Well, um, both actually, because uh, print, when printed language uh, developed, you know, we've been speaking for probably for way longer than we've been reading. We've been speaking for at least 20,000 years and maybe longer than that, whereas we've been reading for about 5,000 years. So at some point the, um, uh, the, in the evolutionary pathway, the ability to make a connection between sounds and symbols uh, became possible. But in order to do that, if that isn't long enough for it to evolve. So what the brain did was, um, what the brain does is through training, it essentially uses some of those same uh, pathways and structures that, um, and circuits that, are, that have evolved for oral language, for speech, and for, oral, for speech, and uses those to perceive letters which often look a lot like very common things in, uh, you know, in a culture. So reading, it's a very, uh, reading and print, very culturally bound. Yeah. So is that why a student that has articulation errors often has trouble reading? That's part of it. Not so much because of the speech, but probably, um, but it's associated with, it can be associated with slow processing of sounds. 
so that they're not uh, perceiving or they're not, their auditory channels are not hearing the sounds quickly enough to reproduce them accurately. So, and, and interestingly enough, research, you know, all this fMRI research has shown us that actually the brains, the reading brains of people in different cultures and languages do behave in different ways. So someone who is, a, someone who's Chinese and reads Chinese has a different neurocircuitry for reading than people who read English. And, and you know, people who read German are yet again a little bit different. So every brain is, is, is really unique. Um, and I, having worked in this field and with wonderful, brilliant students who are also dyslexic, I've come to feel that talk about them having a reading disorder or, uh, you know, sin various things is probably a little harsh. And I would, I think that um, we know that there's a fixed percentage of, of our population across all cultures, probably 15 to 20 percent of people who fall into what might be called a dyslexic uh, pattern, uh, that it really is just, it's a kind of a, it's just a different brain arrangement. We call it um, cerebrodiversity, sort of a big word, but, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's uh, not, not, not exactly a disorder, although, because when you think about it, people who are dyslexic, before the printing press was invented, they were doing just fine, you know? And then along came the printing press and it turned them into a disabled class, you know? So, and it didn't matter so much uh, for a long time because uh, there were plenty of things that people could do without having to read. But that's not really the case anymore. Uh, reading in our information age is really, really um, crucial. So we, <clears throat> uh, we need to look at ways that we can improve uh, the number of children who are able to read more uh, fluently and effectively uh, and how to get them there. And there are a number of ways. So um, the... Um, the early reading brain, early development, is pretty much shaped by environment. So middle class families have, have a tendency to talk to their children and read books to their children and uh, read poems, Mother Goose, uh, which all of which leads to uh, changes, awareness in the brain, first of all, sounds, through rhyming and so on emotional development, hearing stories about, say, frog and toad are friends and how they care for each other and so on. So gradually emerges an ability to imagine what it's like to be somebody else, you know, to care and so on. Uh, vocabulary development is huge, huge. And we're finding that there's an, there is a huge difference between, uh, between readiness for reading of middle class children, children from more enriched language environments, and those from uh, impoverished language environments. In fact, um, one estimate recently is that children from impoverished language backgrounds have heard 32 million words less than middle class children when they get when they get to kindergarten. And it just the gap just widens from there. So we're uh, that is really not acceptable and we know that it has really dire consequences for children in terms of their future in reading. So so, how does this develop, and what do we need to do to 
facilitate uh, learning to read and to address issues uh, with children and others who are struggling with reading, struggling readers. Well, first of all, uh, this, there's a, this is an acronym, POSSUM. You know, something. And uh, first of all, we need to, uh, first of all, we need to teach the sound system of the language, the, what we call phonology, which is sounds. And that we do by looking at